Welcome to Taxpayer Alert. I'm Al Sagala. I'll be your moderator. I'm also president of the Calaveras County Taxpayer Association. These programs almost always feature really interesting, knowledgeable people, and they can almost be training tapes on what's happening in local government. This is no exception. We, we're introducing our, our new CEO, Tim Lutz. Tim, welcome to the show. Hey, Al, thank you. <laughs> um, all right, Tim. Uh, a little background about yourself. All right. Um, background about myself. Well, first of all, I actually grew up in um, the El Dorado County area, Pollock Pines, um, and went through high school there before I went down to the Central Valley for, um, for college at Fresno State. And then shortly thereafter, started working in Tulare County, uh, first with the Human Resources Department, and then ultimately really spent the bulk of my career in Tulare in the Health and Human Services Agency. With Health and Human Services, as similar to here, we have quite a broad range of, of programs that fall under that umbrella. And I had the great opportunity to um, spend time in our social services department as a senior analyst doing budgets. And then ultimately actually was the um, aging services manager over our senior programs and our area agency on aging. Later on, I moved over to fiscal operations as the fiscal operations director for health and human services. And in addition to overseeing the agency's budget, I also oversaw animal services and the office of emergency services. So the nice thing with Health and Human Services is quite a broad range of different areas that I've been able to um, work with and have um, exposure to, but also um, a, a nice, nice background, I, I guess. So then what brought me here is just wanting to get back to Northern California. I genuinely love the, the Sierra Nevadas. I love being here in a small town um, rural area where you really get to, a chance to know people and build strong relationships. I think my personal management philosophy is we accomplish a lot through the relationships that we build. It's, uh, that, that's very interesting and that's a, really a blessing because uh, uh, one of the things that your job, you're in control of everything, is to uh, have things work smoothly and uh, this requires really good skills and communication. Now, your experience in, on, in uh, animal control and uh, hum, uh, human services, uh, so that means you know how to fire and hire people <laughs> and take care of dogs. So that's really... We'll see. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's really a good thing. Um, one of the important things, of course, uh, is budget and revenue. And I think um, you have some thoughts on that. Yes, just a couple. I One of the things that when I decided and took the job offer for Calaveras County, that was one of the areas that I wanted, that I knew coming in I needed to focus on straight away. Looking at the county's budget and most importantly what drives that county's budget is um, the revenues. Right. And I'll, as as everybody who you'll talk to will say we've really been for the last really five, eight years in a stagnant state with the county's budget. Small little growth here or there um, had decreases as a result of the downturn and then the valuation going down with um, the downturn and then the Butte fire. So for me, I really am taking a very close look as I enter into this budget cycle on how are we 
um, how are we looking at our general fund revenues? How are we evaluating the, the tax roll? I'm meeting a lot with the different department heads to get an understanding of some of the challenges that they have, whether it be short staffing, whether it be just turnover or inexperienced staff. All of those things impact us on being able to effectively, in the case of assessments, bring our tax rolls up to date or in another area, um, looking at our, how we collect our taxes. One of the areas that I'm looking at and having a meeting with next week is to look at our transient occupancy tax because that does present an opportunity to provide a, a decent influx of some revenue. The, this county, because we do have a decent tourism um, base coming in, it's important that we're looking at it the issue, of course, is the industry's changed so much from the, you know, 10, 15 years ago where you had hotels or you, um, other types of places that are renting rooms. It was very straightforward. Introduce modern Internet and how um, flexible things have become with, prime example, Airbnb, where anybody can basically sign up, put their property for rent. Mm -hmm. and someone comes in and rents it. Well, it's a lot more complicated to try and identify all of those properties mm -hmm. and make sure that they're um, actually contributing the proper transient occupancy tax um, to the county. And it makes a huge difference when we're looking at the sheer volume of now the Airbnb usage. So those are some of the key concerns that I have is, are, are we being effective at maximizing the opportunities for revenue through effective collecting of, of taxes and also um, making sure that the assessor's office has the resources it needs to be able to get an updated tax roll and also um, meet the needs of the residents of the county. Well, I understand that there's two, two sides to the, uh, to the budget. Uh, one is... Uh, the revenue side, mm -hmm. and the other one is the expense side. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on reducing expenses? I do have some thoughts. Um, you know, one of the hard things with going a long time in kind of a status quo mode is you tend to let some things um, lax because you just don't have staff or manpower to right. try and monitor and, and "Quote unquote police things," right. and so I'm taking a close look at how we manage our contracts um, within Calaveras County, what we do with purchasing, making sure that really, if in some cases having a little more centralized purchasing role gives us an opportunity to maybe negotiate with vendors on right. better deals, save costs, and ensure that when departments are buying necessary equipment and resources that they're getting the best possible deal. Right. I think there's a lot of opportunities to look at those controls and provide some support to departments on on things like purchasing and contracts, while at the same time making sure that we're guarding the taxpayer dollars. So those are some of the key areas that I'm looking at. Truthfully, when I look at staffing, I, I really think most of our departments are operating at a pretty bare bones staffing mm -hmm. level. So I'd really be looking at a lot of opportunities for how can departments work better together Right. so that they can accomplish the same goals without necessarily having to do as much increasing of, of staff needs. Right. And are we really being efficient in using um, our, our contracts and purchases? I see. The, um, one of the uh, in, uh, important things is, uh, is keeping good people. Mm -hmm. And this has an effect on the bottom line because uh, employees that are skilled and motivated uh, produce more than those otherwise. And one problem that the county has, um, it's been expressed anyway, is losing people. Uh, they come here to get trained and they go to other counties that may pay more. We think that's true. And 
it seems like one of the ways to find out what's really happening would be the exit interview. In other words, when somebody leaves to go to another county, uh, it's very important to get their opinion, uh, and, and it has to be a truthful opinion. And I not I don't know how that could be done, but I imagine it would fall in in your your category is to try to find out why people are leaving. Is that true? Um, it would. Human resources is a function of the CAO's office. I right. have a um, deputy CAO who is the director of human resources. And we do try and do exit surveys on staff. Obviously, that is a voluntary right. um, situation. And we, I, and I do agree with you that trying to identify factors that are contributing to people leaving is essential. Right. I I, I agree that some of it is that we do lose good people who are um, wanting to go to a different area for, for more pay. Right. I think that's part of it. Part of it also, I think, is demographic shifts in terms of who our workforce is. Um, I'm, I'm kind of at the, at the front edge of the the generation of everybody, you know, kind of shifting jobs more often with that expectation that, that a lot of younger people entering the workforce are not staying in jobs for a career as much as this is a job experience and moving on. It's really hard to try and overcome that. One of the areas that I think as government where we lag a little bit behind private sector in terms of developing new and innovative ways to try and keep the younger generation engaged in the workplace, wanting to stay, and providing opportunities for growth and, and learning. Those are things that, of course, take money, right. but at the same time, I think, are critical because what we don't really capture is the cost of losing an employee, the lost productivity, having to now take a lead worker off doing whatever work they're doing to try and train somebody. And that is a huge cost to the county, one that more recently I think we've really started to identify as, as a major factor impacting our ability to, to respond quickly to um, the residents' needs. Hmm. That's... Uh... It's pretty wise, pretty wise observations. <laughs> uh, one of the things that is a consideration in budget is um, re, uh, CalPERS retirement, and I understand there's a uh, uh, a uh, unfunded liability that goes with that. And uh, some communities have gone bankrupt and actually went after re reducing the the uh, payments to people that are already retired mm -hmm. by as much as fifty percent. And I'm sure we wouldn't want to ever get in a position like that. And also, uh, is it possible to to leave the CalPERS system and have a better system in its place? Well, though, that's actually a two-part question. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the, the the locations that the cities that you refer actually one was a city and I think one was a special district that yeah. ended up going defunct and and disappearing were instances where they did try and leave CalPERS. And so in answer to your, to your point about would it be a f more effective to leave the system is, is really at this point probably a, a non-starter type of a question right. only because that un what happens is and why CalPERS has, has devalued those retirements is when the municipality leaves, CalPERS basically goes in and looks at here's what the person should have paid in based on what their benefits are supposed to be for the remainder of of their expected life. Right. Well, when they say that you have this much of an unfunded liability, they basically back out all of that unfunded liability from that those remaining pensioners' pensions, right. and that's why you see those reductions. So for us to be able to leave without impacting our retirees' benefits, right. we would have to pay all of the unfunded liability up first and then pull out of CalPERS, which would be an exceptionally expensive proposition, one with 
we just don't have the funds to be able to do it. Right. Um, and then an answer to would it be more effective to go to a different plan if it were feasible? Yeah. Um, so much of that depends on how good the plan is. Um, you would have a lot of investment people that would say yes, they could earn a better rate of return, they could manage your funds better than CalPERS has. Yeah. Coming from Tulare County where we had our own retirement system outside of CalPERS. Oh, really? Um, yeah, we were a 37, it's a 1937 Act County um, that has its own um, funded retirement system um, called Tulare County Retirement Association, very, very aptly named. And with, with that, we had our own retirement board that was elected strictly by members um, within the county. And we actually did, in Tulare, um, very well. They managed it. We still had an unfunded liability, but nothing to the extent of CalPERS unfunded liability. Yeah. I, there, there seems to be politics um, woven into it where, where the in, uh, anticipated revenue is used uh, as a means to uh, uh, apportion how the money flow is to be. And if um, the real income on investments is 3% or 4% and you claim it's 7.5, well, then you're building up a a uh, huge um, imbalance that will have to be paid by the, by the employer or paid pay by the county at some point. And, and my comments to that would be I, I agree. And I think part of why you had a retirement system in, in Tulare that did better is that the retirement board was very, very conservative on what it did, its estimates on rates of return on, and typically did as well, if not sometimes a little better than their estimated rate of return. Yeah. As we all look from afar at Sacramento and yeah. the over-optimistic budget assumptions that they make, yeah. I think a lot of times there were way over-optimistic budget assumptions or return on investment assumptions built into the CalPERS rates that now to unwind those and they make even quarter percentage rate adjustments in it, and it's what all the counties and cities and special districts that are in CalPERS are feeling now, right. that they're having to bring those adjustments incrementally down. And it, it is a very expensive hit because you have a lot of, um, a lot of members within that system. Now, that affects your expenses. Uh, it doesn't provide any income. And that, that uh, really affects on what the money you have to, to run the county. In other words, uh, if you have a, a major hit, then it's going to be less money for uh, all the services that, that we have. I completely agree. That's one of the hardest things that we manage is that employees continue to have the pressure of not only retirement contribution changes that go up, right. and the county bears a huge brunt of that. And then you also have health insurance costs that right. continue to go up. And instead of, even when you're giving employees cost of living adjustments, they still wind up essentially even or even less so than they were. Um, just And a lot of that recently has been the, co the rising costs of health care, um, in addition to, of course, the, the pension costs. What... Um, uh is the comparison between private sector wages and public sector wages. Um, it, it's been suggested that uh, public sector wages are much higher, even though the jobs are more permanent. And when there's an evaluation uh, or a survey, a salary survey, they don't look at the private sector, they look at other public sectors. And some jobs, of course, you have to do that because there is no private sector jobs that are uh, comparable. But what's your thoughts on that? <laughs> that's a really, it's a tough question because I think that's a little mixed. It will depend on, on the industry, at least my experience. Right. If you look at your industry, some of your um, generalized or professional type of um, positions like human resources or um, clerical positions, Areas like that, I would say, on average, you do see the public sector 
probably tracking a little ahead of, uh, ahead of private. Yeah. The area where you where you see the flip of that is a lot of your like information technology almost always is going to be lagging behind information technology in the private sector, particularly when you factor in, they get a lot of bonuses mm -hmm. and things that government doesn't pay. Same with your professional, um, like doctors or um, attorneys. Those typically will always make more in the private sector if they want to go that route. And I think there you get professionals that are making the life choice of um, more more predictable hours, maybe a, um, a retirement system, whereas you don't have the retirement system in private industry. So I, my experience is that can be really mixed. In, in some areas, government does track ahead, in others, um, it, it tracks behind. Is it possible to do um, salary uh, surveys that would take in the private sector when you go into uh, negotiations with the unions? on uh, establishing what the new contracts would be? Certainly we, we would look at that and we do look at that. The hard one, as you pointed out, is you have a lot of positions in government that you just don't have a comparable with um, right. private industry. Prime example, deputies for the sheriff's department. Right. It would be really difficult to do. There's no outside, no. Uh, there's no private sector alternative. Um, so, Within those pockets, it would, or even like building plans examiners, um, you can, you have them maybe in private companies that are are doing, um, you know, architectural plans and then subdivisions and things like that. But it's really difficult in some cases to compare those job classes to what's in the. Um, what's in private industry. But where possible, we certainly do take that into account um, with our clerical positions, human resources positions, things that have a comparable nexus. We would look at that um, in addition to, of course, comparing some of our local, like Tuolumne County, um, the cities, uh, Amador County, um, some of those other rural counties right. along the area that, that have similar positions. Um. That, that kind of seg segues into the concept of uh, uh, contracting out. Um, some communities contract out a lot of the uh, a lot of the services that uh, other counties uh, have uh, have employees do. Uh, one example is building department functions. I understand some of our building department functions are contracted out when the particular uh, task is uh, not long term, maybe related to something. And uh, but other other communities um, uh, contract the entire building department and uh, seem to find, uh, have savings of, uh, reportedly as much as thirty percent over the cost if uh, we're not contracted out. Um, have you had any experience with that? Um, certainly, I've, I've worked with contracted functions and, and known you know areas where we do contract out services. When I was in um, when I was over aging services, I actually ended up um, moving to, it used, we used to provide senior services at our senior centers um, directly through our nutrition program. So mm -hmm. we'd do the hot meals at the senior sites. We'd do the delivery to the meals, seniors in their homes. And I, in that case, I did find that we we just weren't being as efficient as we could. The regulatory changes, the funding changes just meant that we as government couldn't keep up fast enough. Right. And it was actually more efficient for us to contract out. And I actually um, worked with identifying some potential nonprofits. We put out an RFP. We had a fair number of, of applicants and ended up awarding um, a, a contract out for base, for the bulk of our senior services to, in that case, a nonprofit. Um, it could have been a for-profit, yeah. but certainly the nonprofit means you're going to get the best cost savings. And it was a very successful transition. Our service levels actually went up because they were able to leverage some of their existing strengths. Sometimes it works well. Other times, I've I've seen it where um, 
when you try and mix a for-profit venture with nonprofit or with with government that's supposed to be nonprofit right. or a look-alike, um, you don't always get the best bang for your buck, and it, it's it's not always easy to do apples to apples comparison. But certainly, um, I would look at that in terms of. If there's somebody that could do it better, more effectively, cheaper, then we should look at that option. I see. So it's maybe uh, there's some light at the end of the tunnel along those lines. <laughs> Everything is a possibility. <laughs> yeah. Coming in, looking at our budget and revenue, I really think we need to. Every stone needs to be overturned and, and looking okay. at yeah. what are the options. So you're kind of open and flexible. As I tell my team, you know, let's throw it on the wall, see what sticks. Right. I mean, we need to be open to possibilities. You want to provide good government at the minimum cost. Yes. Uh, the ban ordinance, uh, this is kind of a, a hot-button issue. And as I understand it, the Board of Supervisors has, uh, uh, by majority, voted to uh, establish a ban of commercial cannabis. In the meantime, they have a regulatory uh, program in place uh, called emergency or urgency ordinance and which can be changed and superseded um, it seemed like it uh, it'd be good in, when they come up with what the ban ordinance would be that it go to referendum so the public would approve it um, what are your thoughts on that i I think um, a lot of us were disappointed that at the end of the day the the referendum or the initiative going before the voters was overturned, right. mostly because this has been such a such a hotly contested community issue where, you know, it, it's really, I would be hard pressed to find something that I see such a, you know, such a divide amongst people right. on in the community and putting it to the voters really as the, the best gauge of you know, yeah. what is the community support behind? That being said, that right now isn't obviously all on the table. Right. And so it does fall back then to the board. And the board has um, asked department, the planning department to bring forward the ban ordinance. Right. Our, the last I, I looked, our plan is um, that it was going to be released, I believe, early next week on the website for planning for the public to review it. There will be a comment period um, in addition to the um, environmental impact report that is going to be coming out, um, if not late next week, um, the beginning of the following week, again for public comment. Right. And I'm sure there will be a lot of discussion at the Board of Supervisors at that point. Our taxpayer group would probably be involved even though we won't have a position for or against. We certainly want the truth to be there. Yes. And uh, with two minutes left. Let's look ahead, what you see uh, in the long-term planning and structure. What are your thoughts? Um, long-term planning, one of the things that the board is very interested in looking at is um, coming together and we're going to be, I'm working out the details now with um, the California State Association of Counties on doing a facilitator um, to come in and really do strategic planning and goal setting for the county on a going forward basis. Um, I wish we had more time oh. for that topic. That 30 minutes goes so fast. Thank you for watching. Taxpayer Alert. We'll see you next time. That was really good.